Please be seated. Good evening. I'm glad you're here tonight. Um, Acts chapter 27 this evening. Sunday night through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We come now to Acts chapter 27. We remember, as we spoke last week, that in chapters 26 uh, through 28, the remaining section of uh, the book of Acts, that there is an overarching theme of the sovereignty uh, of God, that He rules over all and He overrules all uh, for His purposes in our lives, even when it uh, can look a little iffy at the moment (laughs) to recognize that uh, that is what is, uh, is happening. And rarely God has already given the Apostle Paul uh, the promise that just as he had borne witness uh, of Jesus in Jerusalem, so too he would do it uh, in the city of Rome. And that is going to happen, uh, but there's a lot that can happen between the giving of the promise and the fulfillment of the promise. I always like the root that is uh, straight as the crow flies, as they say, uh, and, and preferably at a, a couple of hundred feet in the air, uh, or 30,000 uh, uh, feet in the air, above all of the turbulence and all, and uh, it's rarely like that, because uh, um, as we mentioned last week, God is so much of uh, life is the journey between the receiving of a promise and then the fulfillment of the promise. And God is knocking out a lot of things in terms of teaching us uh, beyond his faithfulness to fulfill the promise, but his faithfulness to do it despite all of the things that can rise up in life uh, against that occurring within our lives. And there's also a bunch of things that he wants to knock out through our lives between uh, on the, the journey of life. And uh, we're going to see that in Paul's life too as he ends up on a certain island and ends up preaching the gospel to great effect. We look here in chapter 27, verse 1, and we remember that Paul, he's innocent, uh, and not only innocent of any charge, there's no charge at all that's been laid against him. Uh, And so he formally now begins his uh, journey to the city of Rome to stand before Caesar having appealed his case, his, the warrantless case, uh, to Caesar. And uh, he begins to make his way uh, now and when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, that is to Rome. Uh, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to uh, a man by the name of Julius. He was a centurion of the Augustan regiment, a very highly esteemed uh, regiment. Um, a part of the Roman legions that were uh, that attended personally uh, to the Caesar. So uh, they have entrusted Paul and these other prisoners uh, into this man, very, very capable hands, very, very uh, serious hands. We notice that Paul is going to make his way from the city of Caesarea to Rome in the company uh, of this Roman centurion and his fellow soldiers, um, a a significant number of fellow prisoners who will be uh, distinctive from the Apostle Paul uh, in that Paul is going to Rome as a prisoner of Rome without having a charge laid against him. All of the other prisoners will have had charges laid against them, found guilty, and they are a good portion of them headed to Rome Uh, in order to now feed uh, the unending supply for entertainment of the Roman crowds at that time in the Colosseum and elsewhere in fighting against wild animals and gladiators. So you can be sure that Paul shares the gospel uh, with these other prisoners and they would have been, uh, no pun intended, a captive audience and, and really have, have been eager to hear what he had to say, uh, knowing what was the, in their immediate future upon uh, uh, getting to Rome. You notice that word, uh, we, uh, that Luke, the author, Dr. Luke, of human author of, of the book of Acts, uh, it was decided that we should sail to Italy. So at this point in time, the Apostle Paul is going to travel all the way from Caesarea, 
through all of the drama that's going to occur before getting to Rome, all the way into Rome, he's going to be accompanied by Luke and then also another uh, fellow servant by the name of Aristarchus, which is going to be, uh, he's going to be introduced to us in just a moment. So presumably, uh, Aristarchus and Luke are not headed to Rome on Rome's dime. Uh, they have paid their fare in order to uh, accompany uh, the Apostle Paul. And so entering a ship of uh, Adramitum, uh, we put to sea and uh, meaning to sail along the coasts of Asia, Aristarchus of Macedonia and Thessalonica, fellow Christian, was with us. And so the next day we landed at Sidon and uh, Julius treated Paul kindly, gave him liberty to go to his friends and uh, receive uh, care. And uh, so uh, here he, uh, they make this journey up the coast and uh, as they uh, make their way to Sidon, would have been uh, an overnight journey or a day and a night, 69 miles north of Caesarea uh, in modern day uh, Jordan, probably stopped there to unload uh, uh, cargo. Uh, the ship that they're on presently uh, is a ship that was one that stayed close to the shore, didn't head out into the greater Mediterranean Sea, wasn't built for that, wasn't built for that kind of uh, 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 treachery or danger, and so it would just kind of skirt uh, the coast and then take these, uh, their products then to all of these different cities. So uh, clearly here, uh, the, the Roman centurion, he would have liked to have found a ship that would have taken him and all of his prisoners on a uh, direct uh, 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 sailing uh, journey from Caesarea to Rome. But unfortunately, in Caesarea, those weren't kind of a common ship to find. And so if you go to an airport, for instance, and you go to a smaller airport, and you want to go to a major city somewhere else in the world, what you'll have to do is go on a smaller plane uh, that will then take you to a larger hub where you can then get a nonstop flight the rest of the way. It was the same thing was true related to shipping in those uh, days. So he is just making his way with his prisoners until he can come to a port where there's a large enough ship headed to Rome uh, that he can then uh, commandeer and uh, use for his purposes for the transportation uh, of, uh, of his prisoners. Julius is very uh, kind to Paul. Uh, I don't doubt that he came to respect Paul and uh, certainly maybe had something to do with the fact that he recognized that this, uh, the treatment of this man by Roman justice has been uh, completely unfair. So when they come to the city, he gives them freedom to go and see other Christians uh, within the city to pick up any needs that he will need going forth uh, on the journey. And then from the trip from Sidon to Myra, when we had put to sea from there, we sailed under the shelter of Cyprus. Uh, maybe your uh, Bible has a map that's helpful in showing this journey, unless you have a photographic memory of uh, the Aegean Sea and the Adriatic. But uh, they uh, put to sea from there, sailed under the shelter of the island of Cyprus because the winds were contrary. And so Cyprus uh, 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 provided uh, shelter against the winds for a smaller ship that was working uh, the coastlines. And when we had sailed over the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurion found an Alexandrian ship uh, sailing to Italy, and he put us on board. All right, so now he finds uh, the nonstop flight to Rome. And, uh, and, and it's an Alexandrian ship. Uh, Rome was a large city uh, then, uh, large by any standard, certainly a very large city in the ancient world with a lot of citizens and uh, more citizens than they could feed within Rome or within the Roman Empire or certainly Italy um, with uh, what they raised in terms of grain. Egypt was a breadbasket for 
uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, the grains that were uh, 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 raised there turned into bread, and of course the Caesars were always very concerned to make sure that the population had bread. You want riots or insurrection, um, just start to starve people. So they're very careful about that. So here's a ship that's making its way from Alexandria in Egypt, laden with grain to take to Rome just for this purpose. And uh, probably, as was the case in those days, uh, Rome would not buy these ships. Uh, they would uh, kind of lease these ships. They would bring them under contract and, uh, and the owner of the ship would be well paid by the Roman Empire, at least fairly paid, uh, to then transport. In fact, Rome uh, found this grain and the transport of the grain uh, so important to their security uh, that very often they would provide insurance to the owner of the ship uh, if, uh, if the, the cargo was, was lost. So here is uh, this Roman centurion and uh, Julius, and he commandeers in the name of Rome, commandeers the ship now, not entirely for his purposes, but now in part for his purposes of of transporting uh, these, uh, these uh, prisoners. And so uh, then uh, as they uh, made their way in, in a journey of, from Sidon to Myra of about 500 miles and uh, usually requiring about uh, uh, 15 uh, days. And uh, so uh, they're making their progress toward, uh, toward Rome. And then from Myra in verse 7, uh, they, uh, we had sailed slowly uh, many days and arrived with difficulty off uh, Sindus, the wind not permitting us to proceed. And of course, they had no motors in those days, so they were at the mercy uh, of the wind. And we sailed under the shelter of Crete off uh, Salomone. And uh, so they uh, are using the shelter of the island to protect them from uh, winds that are contrary to what it is that where they're wanting to go in that direction. And passing it with difficulty, uh, th that city off, uh, off, um, uh, of Crete, uh, then passing it with difficulty, we came to a place uh, called Fair Havens uh, near the city of Lycia. Uh, Fair Havens is a, uh, it is a special name to me. It was the um, name of the Plymouth Brethren Church in the Bay Area uh, that my dear uh, friend, and, and if he would uh, dare to allow me to call him uh, one of my mentors, uh, Bill McDonald, uh, attended church. And now when much time had been spent in sailing now, uh, was now a danger, was now dangerous because uh, the fast was already upon them, Paul then rose up to uh, advise them. So unfortunately, the waves are not cooperating them uh, with them. They're spending more time uh, at these ports than, uh, than they would have liked. The clock is ticking. Uh, they waited for that change of wind at Fairhaven, and while they did so, there was significant time was being uh, lost. And uh, when it talks here about, uh, in verse 9, that the fast was already passed, that re re refers to uh, the Jewish feast of, uh, 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 of a Day of Atonement. Now that's passed, and that year the Day of Atonement fell on October 5th, and uh, navigation in that part of the Mediterranean uh, to make your way toward uh, Rome always dangerous after September 14th. It was considered um, impossible uh, after November uh, uh, 11th. And, uh, and so you would have to find a port and then you would have to port the ship until mid-March. And so uh, this means they are now well into the dangerous season for uh, sailing on the Mediterranean Sea. At this point, it becomes clear uh, to everyone, not just Julius, not just the owner of the ship and the sailors, but the prisoners and everybody else on the ship, that um, it might not be a good idea to continue this, uh, this journey. 
It's very late in the season, and, uh, and, and we ought to consider uh, getting into a port for uh, the winter. And so uh, the only question on the table uh, is everybody's kind of in agreement with that at this point, even, uh, even Julius and even the, the captain and the owner of the ship. The only question that's on the table is whether they should remain in the port of Fairhaven uh, for the, the uh, winter or they should make their way to another port on the island uh, that possessed a, a safer kind of harbor for wintering during uh, the uh, during the winter storms in a place called uh, Phoenix, as we'll get to that in, in verse 12. At this time, Paul stands up and uh, uh, re realizing the danger, and he said, men, I perceive. So this is not, he is not speaking prophetically. He's not speaking on behalf of the Lord. This is his learned opinion of the circumstances uh, about moving the ship from Fairhaven out of that safety of that harbor, however small a harbor it might be, to try to get to the harbor of Phoenix. And he said, men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, not only of the cargo and ship, uh, but also of our own uh, lives. And so Paul uh, speaks here. Uh, this is his opinion. It's an opinion born, uh, I'm sure, out of his own personal experience. Someone might ask, what in the world made Paul such an expert on sailing and to speak so authoritatively to experts in the field and uh, related to all of this? Well, Paul wasn't an expert on sailing, but he was an expert on shipwrecks. He had a PhD in shipwrecks. Uh, he had been shipwrecked three times in the course of his uh, service to the Lord. And uh, at one time floating on debris for a day and a night. Uh, that's one way to see the Mediterranean. And, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and before being rescued. Someone has added up Paul's 11 sea journeys that are uh, recorded in Scripture, and estimates are that he had traveled at least 3,500 miles by sea, all told. And so, uh, he, uh, Paul chimes in on what is his opinion here. Nevertheless, the centurion uh, was more persuaded by the helmsman, the pilot of the ship, and the owner of the ship by, than by the things spoken by Paul. And he certainly can be forgiven for that. Um, uh, here you have this uh, Jewish rabbi evangelist uh, chiming in from his end of things and uh, as opposed to the pros. And, uh, and so uh, Julius goes with them and makes the decision uh, to move to this other harbor because the harbor that they were in, Fairhaven, was not suitable to winter in. Uh, the majority advised to set sail from there also, if by any means they could reach uh, Phoenix, a harbor of Crete opening toward the southwest and the northwest, and then uh, be able uh, to winter there. And so to move from Fairhaven to uh, Phoenix was a journey of about 40 miles by sea to the west. Under uh, normal circumstances, it would have been a very, very short trip, uh, just a matter of a few hours required in order to, to do that. But of course, everyone in my generation remembers what happened with a certain crew that took a three, three hour cruise, a three hour tour, and uh, Every bit of that is going to happen uh, here. And so the determination is made to do this. And when the south wind blew softly, and this is what they were hoping for, supposing that they had obtained their desire, they put out to sea and they sailed close by Crete uh, to make it to uh, Phoenix. And so at this point, Paul uh, looks like he is... Uh, stepped out too far and given counsel that uh, wasn't the best counsel and they were getting their, their dream now to get to that port. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called uh, Eurocladon. Oh, had a name for it. You only name storms that are really bad. I like the Eurocladon, though. It just has a ring to it, to me. You ever wonder about these people that have to find a name for the new rides at 
um, these amusement parks? Well, I would humbly submit this as a potential title for a ride. Uh, and, uh, or, or maybe if, you've, uh, if you're developing all-terrain vehicles, wow, you got a new uh, 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 vehicle here. Uh, you picked up a new Eurocladon. Let's go out for a ride with it. I just like it. And so when the ship was then caught by this storm and couldn't head into the wind, they let her drive. And uh, so they realize, I go from one moment to smooth sailing, just the wind they want, and now they have lost complete control of the ship. Now it's one thing to read this in the comfort of this room. Everybody comfortable? I'm certainly comfortable. Um, but it's another thing to put ourselves in their shoes and to try and experience that, as it's not most of our experience. So they couldn't head into the wind, and they just let the Eurocladon drive the ship. And running under the shelter of an island called uh, Clauda, uh, again, they're looking for any kind of land that relief that can give them to the storm. We secured the skiff with difficulty, and the skiff was like a tender boat. Uh, if you've ever been on a cruise or a lifeboat on a large ship, and so they uh, uh, secured uh, uh, that so that it wouldn't be blown off of the ship in the storm. And they did so with some considerable difficulty. And when they had taken it on board, they used cables to then undergird uh, the ship uh, and fearing lest they should run aground at the citrus sands. And so uh, they know they're in real trouble. Now they begin to run cables underneath uh, the ship in order to uh, uh, help uh, gird uh, the wooden structure of the ship. They realize the, the storm is so great it, it, has the, uh, it is threatening to break the ship up uh, altogether. And their great concern was that uh, the storm being so great they have no idea how far they're being driven at all uh, on the sea that they would run aground uh, on uh, the citrus uh, sands. And so the citrus stand, sands were uh, a, 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 a location in North Africa, and it was really a graveyard of, of ships in those days. And so they thought, we're going to we're doomed, and that's, that's, we're headed to the graveyard uh, of, of, of ships. And so uh, the third day, uh, or rather, uh, uh, verse uh, 18, and because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, I mean, just the, the feel of the whole thing, the next day uh, they lightened the ship. So earlier, Luke had jumped in to try and bring the skiff in on board. Now he, this is a crew. Other people are taking in and uh, starting to throw things off of uh, the ship. And then the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. So if you're ever on a ship and they start throwing the tackle overboard, it's a really bad sign. Because the tackle is what you need to navigate the ship. That's what allows you to control the ship. I mean, they, they realize they have lost, the, such, lost such control of the ship um, that they're throwing necessities overboard in order to lighten uh, the, uh, the ship to survive uh, this storm. And on the third day, we threw the ship's tackle over overboard with our own hands. And now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, uh, all hope that we would be saved uh, was finally uh, given up. So they have no ability in, in those days. Um, a compass is about uh, 1,300 years in the future from this day. A sextet is about 1,700 years in the future for navigating uh, on the seas. All they had were the sun and the moon and the stars to try and navigate their ships. And they cannot for days and nights uh, see uh, the sun or the moon or the stars. They are uh, flying blind at this, uh, at this point. Now, 
um, this particular uh, passage in the book of Acts here where Luke, who was a doctor, we don't know that he owned a yacht, uh, but he was fairly familiar with things, or at least he was very good at writing things down because it's said that in the entirety of the ancient world, uh, there is no uh, single description of navigation uh, at that time in history uh, that compares to this description of, of what he uh, has laid out here in Acts chapter uh, uh, 20. Uh, seven. And so after long abstinence from food, Paul then uh, stood up in uh, the midst of uh, all of the people and he said, men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and this loss. Well, of course, this is not the apostle Paul getting up and say, I told you so. Nobody listens to me around here. No, he's just reminding them that he was right the first time and in order that they would give more serious consideration to what he's about to say at this point in time. They hadn't been eating uh, through all of this, nobody on the ship. Um, this was no sacrifice uh, for them in the sense that um, if you have ever been seasick, uh, the last thing you want to do is eat. It's a miserable feeling, really, being sick, seasick. They could bring anything that you would dream of at any other time in your life of eating and put it in front of you, and you know uh, that if you did eat it, uh, it wouldn't remain in place for very long. And so what? not worth the aggravation. And so he said, you should have listened to me, and now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. And then he gives the reason for his confidence here. For there stood by me this night an angel of God, of the God whom I belong and whom I serve. And this angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. And therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was uh, told me. And uh, however, we must run aground on a, a certain island. And so he says, we're going to shipwreck, the ship's going to be lost, and we're going to run aground on a certain island. And uh, here you have the recognition that uh, everybody thinks that the storm is in, completely con in complete control of the circumstances. And this is Paul's way of being reminded himself, but also reminding everyone else that God is the one who's in the ultimate control of all of this. So much so is that we're not going to wreck on just any oil island out here in the Mediterranean. We are being directed to a particular island. And for particular reasons, as we'll see in, uh, in just a, a few, uh, uh, well, in a few days. It'll be next Sunday. Now, when the 14th night had come, as we were driven up and down in the Adriatic Sea, isn't that something? Up and down in the Adriatic Sea. About midnight, the sailors sensed that they were drawing near some land. And so they took soundings to find out how deep the water was that, where they were, and they found it to be 20 fathoms, about 120 feet. And then uh, they'd gone a little bit further, uh, they took soundings again, and they found it to be 15 fathoms or, or 90 feet. And so they know they're getting closer and closer to shore. And then fearing lest uh, we should uh, run aground on the rocks. They dropped four anchors from the stern and they prayed uh, for day to come. Now, when we go to some place on the coast in the state of California or you go to Hawaii or you go someplace else, um, when we go to the beach, we go to the beaches where there's sand but it's a comparatively small amount of the shoreline in the world that is sand. 
Most of it is rocks. And if you've ever been in uh, uh, a place, say in Hawaii or something like that, and uh, you've got these intermittent beaches, sandy beaches, and then you see these other rocks and people out there surfing, and you just think to yourself, if anyone got thrown against those rocks with the kind of waves that are coming in, uh, they're doomed. And, and uh, so they're very concerned uh, about not just saying, well, let's head toward the island and it'll all uh, end well. The likelihood was not to hit sand, uh, but to hit rocks and, and be uh, wiped out. And so they prayed for day uh, to come. And so uh, this certainly communicates to us that as miserable as a uh, shipwreck must be, I want no um, firsthand experience with it in my life, but as miserable as a shipwreck must be, it must be much worse to experience um, at night as opposed to the day. They know they're going to be shipwrecked, but all they can hope for now is that uh, we'll be able to see what it is that we're coming toward when it occurs. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, uh, uh, as they were seeking to escape from the ship, this is the crew, that's never a good sign. Uh, when they had let down the skiff then into the sea under the pretense of putting out anchors uh, uh, from the prow, uh, doing business, Paul knew exactly what they're doing. And he said to the centurion, uh, and, uh, to the centurion and to the soldiers, he said, unless these men stay on the ship, you cannot be saved. And, uh, and so, you know, a crisis always uh, brings out the good and the bad in people. And so here they reveal themselves to be rats and they're going to get off the ship. And Paul is basically saying, uh, we are, we're in considerable difficulty now. Um, if this crew abandons this ship, uh, then, uh, then we cannot be saved. And so the soldiers cut away the ropes of the skiff and they, they let it fall. And as the day was about to dawn, Paul implored them to take food saying today is the 14th day. Uh, so, wow, think about that. 14 days and nights in that condition. Uh, today is the 14th day you have waited and continued without food and eaten nothing. I mean, imagine the weight loss, the dysentery, the seasickness, and, and uh, all, of, uh, all of that uh, going on. So... I mean, that might be um, some competition for Jenny Craig or something like that to just uh, take people out on the Mediterranean for trips like this and uh, lose half your body weight in 14 days. So in all seriousness, it's a long time. And even at this point, they didn't want to eat anything. They still didn't want to eat anything. And Paul found it necessary to urge them now. You need to take nourishment for this is for your survival. You're going to need energy. You're going to need fuel. Your body's going to need it for you to survive what it is that we're going to hit tomorrow since not a, ha a hair will fall from the head of any of you. This is a very interesting passage in terms of uh, a glimpse at the mystery of uh, the God side and the human side related to God's promises. So God gives his promise to them uh, that the ship is going to be destroyed, but all of their lives uh, are going to be spared. But then Paul says, in essence, you need to cooperate with the promise. You need to bring to the promise what you would normally bring to that promise and not neglect that just because God has given you a promise. So they needed to eat. They needed to go on about doing what was, what was right and smart and in the natural. And so when he had said these things, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of all of them, uh, just like Jesus did publicly and and feeding the 5,000, and when he had uh, broken it, he began to eat himself. 
And they were all encouraged and also took food for themselves. How exciting to see that change that must have occurred related to all of them. And in all, there were 276 persons on the ship. And when they had eaten enough, uh, they lightened the ship. And here, the last thing to go overboard was the wheat into the sea. And so they wanted to take all of the weight off the ship that they could so that the ship would come up as high as it could on the water and thus make its way as far toward the shore before um, it uh, wedged itself on the shore, giving them a shorter distance to then um, uh, swim to the shore. And when it was day, they didn't recognize the land, uh, nothing they had seen before, but they observed a bay with a beach and onto which they plan uh, to run the ship if possible. All right, we've got a bay with a beach, and that's where we want to uh, go. And, uh, and they let go the anchors, and they left them in the sea, and then meanwhile loosing the rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail, uh, to the wind uh, to make for shore. They, they wanted the full energy to go toward uh, getting them as close to the shore as possible. But as they're trying to do that, they struck a place where two seas met. And so this kind of a, an opening between two sandbars and, uh, and, and they end up, uh, the prow getting stuck. They ran aground. It stuck fast. It remained immovable, the prow being the front of the ship. And the stern, in the meantime, was being rocked by the storm. So the front of the boat is rock solid, firm in one place. Uh, the rear of the boat uh, is being uh, thrown around by the storm. And so something has to give. And it's going to be the ship that's going to give in that circumstances and the soldiers' plan was then at that point to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. I think how cold-blooded these Roman soldiers going to kill the prisoners. I mean, if that environment didn't create some kind of compassion in you for your fellow man, whatever they'd done in the past, I mean, what could? But the Roman soldiers were under, uh, under Roman law. Um, if they lost a prisoner, then whatever was the sentence on the prisoner would then become a sentence on their life. And without a doubt, many of these prisoners had been uh, convicted of capital crimes. And so here they are and, and going to look out for themselves here and say, we can, they can live and then we can die, but that's not what we're going to want to have happen here. But the centurion, Julius, stands up and he wants to save Paul. Paul doesn't have formal charge against him and he likes him. And, uh, and no doubt something supernatural about it as well, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim, they should jump overboard first to get to land first, and the rest, uh, some on boards and some on uh, parts of the ship. And so uh, it was that they all escaped uh, safely um, to uh, land. And uh, 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 those that are in Southern California like to make a special note that um, this is the per first reference to surfing um, uh, in human history as they rode those, uh, those boards um, in. And then we pick things up uh, next week in chapter 28. I, I do want to go back <clears throat> a little bit in closing for uh, a meditative uh, thought is to go back to this place in verse 20 where Luke declares... Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we, plural, everyone on the ship, would be saved, was finally uh, given up. And so, at some point in the course of, of all of this, uh, some, everyone lost their hope, and as is the case, everybody has a different breaking point in life, um, everybody 
Some people can be more pragmatic than others in terms of seeing the handwriting on the wall and, and uh, realizing their condition and uh, more the pessimist than the optimist, but they had lost, some of them had lost their hope earlier than others. And, and finally though, even the strongest and the most hopeful, uh, at this point they lost hope. And so just like on that entire ship, just like a candle bl being blown out, all hope of being saved was gone and the hearts of everyone on the ship. Hope ceased to exist on that ship and it just settled down on all 276 of them. Um, we're going to die. We are not going to survive um, this uh, storm. And so you see how Luke puts it, all hope uh, given up, all of it gone, not a bit of it left on board. The word all is an interesting one that he uses in speaking about hope here. It means all, it means uh, totality, it means each and every, it means entirely, it means full, absolute, in every uh, respect. And that's the word that Luke uses here to describe uh, the, the loss of hope that uh, occurred on that ship. And so uh, here, all of it is, is completely gone. And Paul, when he addressed the crew and the passengers, he uh, reminded them, as we've seen, uh, that, uh, that they should have listened to him. And then, but he stands up and he speaks now to infuse hope back into a situation where hope has disappeared. And he lets everyone know um, that, uh, that, that, that stood by him in verse 23, an angel of God. Uh, he, said, for, uh, he said, for there stood by me um, back in the city of Jerusalem, who stood by me and told me that I'm going to make my way to Rome. And based upon that promise, we can all be sure uh, that at least I'm not going to die on this trip, and I don't think you will too. No, that's not where Paul goes to um, infuse hope back into this situation and into his own heart. He said, on this very night, an angel of the God whom, to whom I belong and whom I serve said to me, do not be afraid, Paul. Why would he tell Paul not to be afraid? Except that he was afraid. God doesn't use vain repetitions. He said, don't be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted, to, uh, to, uh, granted you all those who will sail with you and therefore take heart, men. For I believe God uh, that I believe God that it will be just as was uh, told me. And so he speaks this uh, then uh, to them as a source of their uh, comfort and their encouragement. Um, most often, and I've done it myself, when I, uh, in terms of this passage as it's taught, um, it's taught as an example of how uh, Christians need to, in the great storms of life and in the great crises of, uh, crises of life, how we need to stand in the midst of and lead in the midst of, of these great storms. And I have no doubt that that is all true. Uh, but I don't think that quite matches what we have before us here as a lesson. I think that very often as Christians, we can expect the next point of this kind of a sermon to be instruction on how to process, how to navigate these kind of storms in life victoriously, and uh, that you do, we'll do it through some faith of our own or some action or something that is, depends on, on our part. And to take, for instance, and notice the four reasons that Paul was able to take heart uh, in the storm. He realized God's presence was with him. He realized he belonged to God, that he was on duty for God, and, and that whatever life circumstances, and he never lost that mantle even in the greatest of storms. He's fully convinced in, uh, of the faithfulness of God. But I don't see that here exactly. And you can... 
uh, disagree with me on this um, and still be saved. But I put it forth for your consideration. What I see presented here is just a simple person trying to understand the scriptures and to glean everything that I can from them is a storm in life that's so great that it caused everyone on that ship to lose every ounce of hope that they would survive this storm. And that it included Luke, and that it included Paul, and it included Aristarchus. And if it's too much for someone to believe that about Paul, then simply apply it uh, to Luke, because we know that for certain. And you notice Luke's we there in verse 20, referring uh, to everyone uh, on the ship. And why would the angel of God encourage Paul, do not be afraid, Paul, except that he was. And except at this moment in time, he needed to have a reassurance of a promise that had already been given to him that he's going to reach uh, Rome. When, when Paul declares what the angel speaks to him in there, verse, verse 24, he doesn't say, Paul, you got a bunch of people on this ship that are terrified and are now hopeless in the light of this storm. He doesn't do that. He addresses Paul as well. He said, do not be afraid, Paul, for you must be brought before uh, uh, Caesar. And so Paul isn't addressing everybody else's fears on, on the ship and, uh, and the fears uh, that he's uh, devoid of. He wasn't given a message to speak to the entire ship, but a message for himself as well. And in the ferocity of this storm, I would contend that even the Apostle Paul lost any hope of surviving it. And he did so as much as um, anyone else. Now, the Eurachlodon kind of storm in life is not a regular storm. Uh, there are storms in life that, that rock our world. There are big storms. They're not, they're not even just trials. Big storms. And so this isn't a, 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 a trial or a storm. It's not even a deep trial or a storm. This is the kind of storm or trial that's altogether something greater. And you remember the Apostle Paul, he had been shipwrecked three times previously. So he knew storms. He knew tough times in life. This was something entirely different that he found himself in the middle of. And I think it's important to understand as Christians that there are going to be storms in our lives that can be so tempestuous, so Eurachlidon-like, that they can overwhelm us, completely overwhelm us, physically and emotionally and mentally and even spiritually, storms that can leave us with no hope that we will survive them. A man as deeply spiritual as Job knew something about this, he was in a storm that was so deep that while he was in it, he wished repeatedly and openly, vocally, that he had never been born. If being born meant this kind of pain and difficulty in life, he longed for death as a means of escape. Job chapter 6, verse 8, Oh, that I might have my request that God would, would grant the, the, me the thing that I long for that it would please God to crush me, to kill me, that he would loose his hand and cut me off. You might remember King David, long after God had promised that he would become the next king uh, of Israel. He possessed the promise of God, a deeply spiritual man. And yet before becoming king, while he's fleeing from uh, Saul who sought David's death, year after year after year, David finally gives up hope of surviving the storm, seeing the fulfillment of the promise God gave to him. And in 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 1, he said, we're told, and David said in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. And I think that sometimes as Christians, we can think, that no solid or mature Christian could ever go into this kind of a place of despair. After all, a Christian needs to do is just 
remember all of God's faithfulness to us in the past in similar circumstances and everything will be okay. But again, Paul had three shipwrecks at this, in his past at this point and he still lost hope. And I think that sometimes we can think that all a Christian needs to do in any trial is to simply claim uh, some promise of God in the Bible associated with that storm or some promise God has given to us personally and uh, that will make everything better and help us always to see things clearly. But Paul had a promise from God that he would go to Rome and stand before Caesar. And yet in this storm, he was still afraid and he had still lost hope with the others. And when we survive these kind of storms as Christians, and we do survive them always, it's with the consciousness that it wasn't because of how strong we were or how spiritually mature we were or how great our faith was. When we get to the other side of a Eurocladon, we know that we got through them for one reason alone, that God brought me through this. And we know that if getting through that storm had required even 1%, us bringing 1% of our own faith and our own strength into that situation to survive it, we would have never made it. And we know that we got through that one, not because of our faithfulness, but solely because of the faithfulness of God. And we know that we got through that one not because of the grip that we had on God, but solely and entirely because of the strength of his grip upon us. And examples of Eurocladon storms in our life can include the loss of a child, the loss of a beloved spouse, um, a deep violation of trust in our life, Uh, the pain and betrayal that can occur in divorce, a physical disease or deterioration, or uh, living with chronic pain, or some combination of things in life, and there are many other such things. And why does God allow such storms into our lives, even as his children, even while like Paul, we know that we're right in the middle of his plan for our lives? And I don't know entirely, and I don't think anybody does, but I do know that we learn priceless things about God and about ourselves during these times. And I'm convinced things that we might never otherwise learn in the Christian life, certainly not to that degree. We learn deep things and eternal things and priceless things, and God said that we would. In Romans chapter five, and not only that, But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And one of the things that these these kind of storms do in our life, these great massive uh, storms that we wonder whether we're going to survive, one of the things they do is they purify our faith. They also uh, produce a depth of relationship uh, with God and a commitment to God that we make in the depth of that kind uh, of a storm uh, that we might not ever otherwise make in the course of our, our Christian life. It certainly produces a, uh, a massive Uh, thanksgiving and sense of gratitude toward God. And one thing it always does is it always causes us to grow in a way we never thought was possible or necessary in our lives to grow in our understanding of how much this walk with God and relationship with God is grace how it is all grace, not just getting saved, 
but that everything about our Christian life after being saved is the product of His grace in our lives. And I think it produces a a Christ-likeness and a compassion, a humility in our lives, a way of seeing other people in difficulty and being compassionate to other Christians in great storms where at one time we would have been flippant in our counsel or statements to try and make everything better as if that one sentence in my life could, from my life could change all of those things for them. Now we look at them and having been there on some level to some degree, we have a compassion and understanding of people in their difficulties that we might not otherwise have. And if you find yourself in that kind of a storm this evening as a Christian, I want to tell you from this passage, and the passage is one I love, that you will make it as Paul made it here. But it won't be because of your faith or your grip upon him, but it will be because of his own faithfulness and because of the firmness of his grip upon you. And so what did Paul need to do in order to reignite hope here? He needed a reminder of God's promise to him, don't be afraid, Paul, you must be brought before Caesar. And then with it a reminder that even though this storm had outstripped all of Paul's resources, it was not even remotely bigger than the God who had promised that promise to him. And that the storm would not have the final say in this chapter in Paul's life. It would not be the final chapter in Paul's life. God would have the final say. And so it is with you, and so it is with me. Though God can appear so absent at times like this, one day you'll look back and you'll see his fingerprints all over your life during this time. And one of the conclusions we can come to in a storm like this, is that we are in this storm storm alone. Uh, God is nowhere to be found when in fact the opposite um, is true. I've been through an uh, Eurachlodon twice in all the years that I've walked with the Lord since 19... Um, 80. And sometimes people um, will find themselves in a similar circumstance and they will say, "Um, what can you tell me about surviving a storm like this? And they're disappointed that I don't have one, two, three, four, five things that slip off my tongue as an explanation for me making it through that storm. But the only hope I can offer to them is that you'll make it and that God will make sure that you make it. And that you can hold on to. And these things, when we look and we feel like we're all alone, and this thing where um, storms that we hit, we wonder where is God and what is happening in this. And I think uh, when just the opposite is true, God is very active in the situation. We just can't see it yet. It's all perfectly captured in uh, the uh, famous poem, Footprints in the Stand, Sand. One night I dreamed a dream, it goes, and as I was walking along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life, and for each scene I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, 
one belonging to me and one to my Lord. And after the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand, and I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest of times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me. So I asked the Lord about it. Lord, you said once I decided to follow you, you would walk with me all the way, but I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why. When I needed you most, you would leave me. And he whispered, my precious child, I love you and would never leave you. Never ever during your trials and testings. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. And it's true. And it's true. And God carries us through these kind of trials. As Paul put it, if we are faithless, he always remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And if you sit here tonight in that kind of a storm or online and you look at your life and you look at the promises of God and you say, I'm not sure I can even believe them right now. That can happen in life. But God believes them and that's what matters. And you will make it through just as everybody on that ship did. I'd like to stop just for a moment and invite the worship team to come forward. And I give you complete permission as I ask them to lead us in a couple of worship songs in closing to leave and get your children or whatever other deadlines that you have. But I love this passage so much that I thought it would be nice to just sing a couple of songs of praise to the Lord for how incredibly faithful He has been to us, not only in our salvation, but in our Christian walk. And so let's praise the Lord here this evening as we close.